All right, we're now live and people are coming in. Welcome, cool. everybody. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, Mata, you have October 21st. Perfect. Great. I'm going to hop right in there. All right. I'll wait for everyone to sort of stream in. I'm not sure if everyone gets in at once or if Zoom likes to make us like feel like we're anticipating as the number ticks up slowly. I don't know if that's a gimmick or if that's legit as people come in, if it's a server issue. So I'll just give everyone a moment. Okay. And we'll sit here awkwardly in silence, I guess, because you know, we're in Zoom. So it's kind of hard to be hey, how's it going? Oh, I want to check. I usually try to watch the attendees. I try to find the names. Let's see who's here. Yeah. We encourage people to say in the chat where you're tuning in from. <laughs> yes, so either in the chat or the Slack channel, which we'll mention the Slack channel a little bit. Tell us where you're coming from. So we have people from all over the world because it's virtual. Uh, Ken Brooks, good to see you, Ken. Let's see, I've got some people. Oh, lots of chat. Great, I love this. Where'd my chat window go, though? Ah, some people from New York, of course, Portland. I saw Brooklyn, Cupertino, Algiers. We have Melbourne. Let's see. If you're from Edinburgh, who would have thought our speaker from Edinburgh would get some people from Edinburgh here? Yeah, I know some of them. <laughs> nice. All right. Usually NYC, but currently Arlington, Texas. I get that. Quebec or Quebec, depending on how you're going to pronounce it. Germany, Winchester. All the New Yorkers, I'm not mentioning you because you're always you know, from there so often. It's what we're based out of. Milan. Oh, Ricardo. Hey, hey Ricardo. All right. I think we have a bit of a critical mass. Mass people will still trickle in as we go, but we'll we'll slowly get started. We'll get started with our announcements. So let's do that first. So as always, folks, I like to say who's hiring, but as the past few months, we can't have people just shout it out. So if you go to the Slack, and Amada posted a link to the Slack is nyhackr.org/slack. There's a link in there. Um, if you go to Slack, you can go post a job. Um, we actually had a, a job posting I think earlier today. Uh, so anyone who wants to hire people, post the jobs there. Anyone who, want, who wants to get hired, go check out the jobs that are posted. Um, I'm very happy that throughout the years, the decade that this meetup's been along, we've gotten so many people's jobs simply by saying, who's hiring? It really works wonders. So go get work. Go find people to do work for you. I'm really excited for that. All right. So jobs, hopefully people will post it. Post it today, post it later, whenever you feel like it. As usual, we want to keep this conversation going. We have the chat window here in Zoom, but also we have this whole Slack community. So there is a Slack channel, the same Slack link you had earlier. Uh, and the Slack channel is called Oct for October, Oct 21 Meetup. So if you search for that in the channels, you could join that. And if you have questions um, about this, about what's going on, go in there. If you want to chat with each other, just make snarky comments, not snarky comments, fun comments, go in there. If you want to ask a question for questions, um, since we obviously can't save the questions for the end, well, we can save them, but we can't ask them all together. Go ahead and ask them, preferably in the Slack, or if you need to in the, in the Zoom chat, and we will collate them and we will ask the question of Katerina a little bit later oh, at the end. Uh, so put all of your questions in Zoom and in, and in Slack, and we will go through them and ask them all for you. Um, those of you who are regulars know how important pizza is to this meetup. So I got mine today from a place called um, Proof. It looks like it's a round pie, but it's actually a, um, a square pie. Rectangular is what they should call it. it. They call it a Brooklyn pie, but I'd call it more of a, well, yeah, it's not a grandma since it doesn't have like crushed tomatoes. I'll call it a, whatever a Brooklyn pie is. I don't think they call this Brooklyn pie in New York, but we'll call it that. So everyone is, uh, Amada's got from Williamsburg Pizza. I went to Williamsburg Pizza and it's cold because I like cold pizza. And I don't remember what kind it is, but it looks really good. But that's actually from Brooklyn. So, you know, at least something's really from Brooklyn. Yeah. Well, not that particular size, but the place she went to, Williamsburg Pizza, originated in Williamsburg. So hope everyone's hope everyone has at home has their pizza as well, because we all know that that is the lifeblood of the world. Um, Ricardo, M Milan, I hope you got some pizza there, and I will argue that pizza really hit its genesis in New York. And sort of, it is sort of had the spark in Naples, but it's really a New York food, and I will live, I will die on that hill. So, a few events coming up. Next month, we have Henrik talking about 
the future package. He wrote the future package, which it underlies a lot of parallelism, especially what you would use when using the fur package, which was just updated by Davis a day or two ago. So you want to learn about how to use the future, which in future package, which exposes futures. Come check out that meetup. Uh, that is November 9th next month. We will announce it in the next few days. In December, kicking off another R week for this year, December 1st is Will Landau talking about targets. Some of you might remember from a uh, few months ago, we, I think Miles McBain was talking about uh, how to use the Drake package. Will wrote the Drake package and he has since decided he's going to make the next version of it and call it targets. So you wanna learn how to use targets and how it differs from Drake come December 1st. And that kicks off, uh, we're doing another con virtual conference this year. Normally we have a conference in Washington, DC. But this year, since we're not going anywhere, we decided to make it a really focused conference. So December 2nd and 4th, yes, the day after that meetup, we are doing an R in government conference. This is for all levels of government, both American government and outside American government. Um, it's federal, local, state, provincial, parliamentary, uh, whatever different governments you have. It's all government focused. We have people from the NIH, from NASA, from various government organizations and NGOs. We have people from um, the United States Army. We have people from all sorts of different walks of government life. And we are announcing tomorrow on the website, it's brand new. He's been a regular, he's always the keynote at New York R. But this year we have Andrew Gelman giving a politically charged talk. So we all know he's a famous political scientist. He's gonna give a very politically charged talk just a short month after the election. So it's gonna be fun to see what he has to talk about. Uh, he will be announced on the website tomorrow. We're very excited to have him. He always puts on a great show at NYR, so we're very excited. So remember, November 9th, we have a meetup. December 1st, we have a meetup. December 2nd through 4th, we have the government conference, including workshops that are government focused. We have John Hirsch giving machine learning for public policy. We have Malcolm and um, Malcolm McKay, oh my God, his last name I'm, I'm scooping on. Malcolm Barrett and Lucy D'Agostino talking about causal analysis. And then Kaz Sakamoto giving a workshop about uh, mapping for public policy. So we are very, very excited for these workshops and these conferences and all these events. So reminder, ask your questions in Slack and we will collate the questions for Katarina and then come the next few months and just sort of hang out and enjoy. And we're going to put on another social meetup at some point. We did it last month, purely social meetup. We're going to do it again. It's got to, we got to just get the timing right. So with that, one of the glory, did I forget anything? Oh, Eco Health Alliance. Thank you, Eco Health Alliance for providing the Zoom link. It's been really helpful. They've been providing the Zoom link since March. Um, they do research in infectious diseases, so it goes nicely. Um, Noam, who's one of the uh, regulars from EcoHealth Alliance, has actually done research on coronaviruses. So it's really cool to have them helping us out. It's uh, very helpful having the Zoom link enabling us all to do this. So with that, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we could have speakers and attendees from all around the world. Um, I think Miles set the record coming from Australia. We're not going to have anyone farther away than that. But coming from across the ocean, we have Katarina coming to us from Edinburgh. We're very excited to hear her talk. So everyone, a big virtual round of applause for Katarina. Thank you. Thanks, Jared. Thank you. Um, we talk. So let's see if I can share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so this does not seem to be letting me do much. So, we saw your screen, but it looked like you're like your note slide. Yeah. So, let me see if I can do something else. Um, just one second. Uh, so. Okay. Let's see if I share now. How's that? Does that work? Hopefully. Looks like we're seeing Beamer or something. Yeah, so this is a, a PDF of uh, stuff I'm about to share. So right, you're all set. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone, and thanks so much for tuning in from um, all these places around the, the world. Um, the topic I wanted to uh, share with you today has to do with data validation in R. Um, just a few things about me before we actually dive in. So 
I work as a data scientist at Tesco Bank. Um, actually, my background is in psychology, uh, which is pretty much how I first um, found out about R. That was around 2012. Um, and I've stuck with it ever since. Uh, it was quite a surprise at the time. I'd never done any, any programming, so quite the revelation that I really ended up uh, loving it uh, during these degrees in psychology and uh, so much so that that's pretty much uh, what I work with today, my main tool. Um, a few uh, years ago, maybe one or two years ago, uh, and for maybe about four prior to that, I used to organize the R meetup in Edinburgh, which is still going strong, by the way. Some people from um, Edinburgh, from the meetup, are actually tuning in uh, tonight. So if you're ever in the neighborhood, please make sure to check them out or attend any meetings. That would be super awesome. Um, and OK, having, having said all that, um, just a few quick words about why data validation, where did the whole idea behind this talk even come from? Um, I think the first time I actually looked into this or um, the idea started to kind of pop up that, oh, this is, this is a really interesting and important topic, I should maybe look into this a bit further, uh, was at a USAR conference quite some time ago, but after that it kind of sat at the back of my head on the back burner until much more recently um, at Tesco Bank until um, a project popped up where this became very, very important. And that's kind of at the foundation of, of this talk and what really motivated the exploration journey that um, fed into all the content I've, I've uh, thrown into these slides. So having said all that, uh, what I've included are some definitions. Um, some uh, principles. There's quite a hefty conceptual component to this talk, and I'm actually going to argue that that's possibly the most important part of this talk, even more so than any R components necessarily, but those are, are included as well, so don't worry. Um, I'll also go over some criteria, so some general things about what you might want to look at or consider whenever you're building or designing the validation rules that should apply to your data. A uh, bunch of dedicated packages that have to do with data validation from the R ecosystem. I'm sure there's more out there, but these are part of the roundup that I prepared for uh, right now. Some additional tools that are not necessarily full-blown packages on the topic. And after that, I'll round up with some uh, conclusions. Um, figured I should maybe start a timer as well. So uh, if we dive in with the definitions first, um, possibly unsurprisingly, data validation is the fact of checking the quality of uh, source data before acting on the data in any particular way. Interestingly enough, I've been coming across various definitions that have to do with or mention the fact that data validation has something to do with how accurate the data is or how correct it is, and actually that's not something I personally agree with. Um, it's possible I'll make various statements that might lead to some discussion at the end, so it's really unfortunate that this is remote, but um, we'll see how that goes. Um, always curious to hear people's uh, input or discuss things. Um, but yeah, so there is a distinction to be made there in between whether or not your data has passed a sequence of validation tests and whether or not it's actually accurate or correct or valid. And basically, this is where my psychology background really comes into play. So imagine a situation where you might have um, a data set that has human participants as um, cases. And in the absence of any information having to do with, say, um, their date of birth, you have just ages. You won't be able, through any data validation uh, rules uh, or processes, to identify whether or not somebody's age is maybe 60 or 61, uh, formally speaking, which is what data validation is really about. Uh, you won't be able to distinguish in between one or the other in terms of correctness. Uh, and that's a really powerful idea also in psychology in terms of classical test theory. So that has to do with thinking of any piece of observed data having to do with, um, especially 
when we're thinking about um, scales or questionnaire data, those sorts of things, every individual data point is basically made up of a true score and error. And you can never fully quantify um, or figure out the sources of, of error. And that's basically not something data validation can help with. So it's important to always remember that. Um, also, because of um, some similarities with data cleaning, I wanted to also distinguish it from that. Is it the same? Not quite, I would argue. Um, to my mind, data cleaning has much more to do with um, one-off, maybe quick and dirty, I hope that's fair to say, um, fixes in the here and now, whereas data validation is more of a step that allows you to uh, future-proof your um, pipeline that you're working with um, and basically anticipate ways in which various problems might arise and always be notified if that happens rather than deal with some kind of static data set um, clean it once and then basically job done. Um, the other distinction to be weary of is there are um, data cleaning kind of by definition means that you are acti acting upon the data and fixing whatever seems to be off about it, whereas data validation doesn't necessarily imply anything like that. You might just be better off depending on your context and we're going to see a bit more about that later. Um, you might be better off just uh, signaling that um, something is off about the data, but not actually changing it in any way. So having covered all that, if we now dive into some actual um, principles, um, hopefully that will go down well as it's quite um, theoretical, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that um, almost everybody, if not everybody will, will be convinced by the end of this section uh, of, the value of covering this first. Um, so the the main inspiration for this entire section is Steve McConnell's Code Complete book, which is really um, quite famous. So interestingly enough, um, data validation in this book is a section that falls under the banner of defensive programming, which is pretty much the coding equivalent of um, basically looking both ways whenever you're crossing a street, even though cars should only in theory come from one side, but basically you want to prepare for the worst, even most unusual circumstances because you want to build um, software that is robu as robust as possible. So that's kind of the underlying idea there. Um, something also that is um, essential and also felt quite striking to me while I was going over the material in this book is that when you're designing software, it could be a shiny app or what have you. Um, it doesn't even have to be um, language specific. That's basically the whole idea of why these principles are important because they're applicable across a variety of uh, contexts and languages. Is that the so often quoted garbage in, garbage out uh, motto uh, doesn't really apply in the world of data validation. What's actually much more important is that a good program should never put out garbage regardless of what it takes in. So that's that's kind of the, the key principle that underlies everything that's gonna follow in this talk. Um, so some better alternatives, uh, Steve McConnell would argue, and I would agree, are garbage in, nothing out, or basically rather than nothing, maybe an app or whatever you're designing should use uh, the last known, reliable data that it has, but not really act in any particular way on the new data that is problematic, garbage in, error message out, or simply no garbage allowed in. And the, this latter um, option is basically what we ended up implementing in an app at Tesco. So um, having said that, it's probably already starting to look like quite a lot of effort is involved in figuring out how to design code that is consistent with all these rules and, and principles. And more often than not, the types of projects that people, I feel, um, end up having to work on have to do with something completely different. It could be uh, forecasting some sort of time series, uh, doing classification, what have you, and anything else that has to do with um, constructing a mechanism for data validation is kind of going to be a satellite problem that might be left behind 
So why should you care about this uh, and you know, spend time and effort on it? Well, I have a, a couple of examples or coding horror stories uh, lined up that hopefully will convince you that it is well worth the effort and the time that you might uh, put in. So first example, uh, both of these examples, by the way, are things that actually happened to me, um, whether or not I was actually the perpetrator or the coder. So the first one, um, a true story um, happened to me, but I didn't have anything to do with the actual uh, system that created the issue. So in a uh, healthcare system from a country I won't actually name, um, what ended up happening was um, I ended up getting some uh, medical tests done, didn't hear anything back from for a while. And at some point I received a letter that was really quite alarming and surprising that whatever results um, actually um, it couldn't, uh, it didn't make sense, something, something like that was in the letter and I had to go back and uh, redo the test, which was uh, very unusual and sent me quite in this kind of uh, state of panic. I thought, what could this mean? This seems very, very bizarre. Maybe the results were really bad and they thought they couldn't possibly be right. So that's why they want to recheck things. But what it later turned out being after a, a pointless uh, appointment that I had to make was that um, the way the system they had operated, it wasn't checking for duplicated records, interestingly enough. And what happened was somebody had already typed up my results on for one case, so for the same patient ID and the same date, what happened afterwards, for some reason, somebody else started to type in um, the same results yet again, but for some reason didn't finish that record. And whenever the system ended up having to act upon this, it was only the incomplete fishy looking record that was taken into account. And that's why I had to, in theory, go back in and redo the whole procedure. So that was actually really quite surprising and stood out, stood out in my mind in terms of something so small that you might be tempted to uh, ignore or have as an afterthought whenever you're running a project can have in some cases like this real um, consequences. So that was that was one of the things I wanted to cover. But the next one sadly has more to do with um, me making the same sort of mistake and um, rushing towards a deadline, but actually um, still planning to do data validation and get into it at some point, but still leaving it kind of as an afterthought and thinking, well, I'll get to it. And before I actually do, hopefully everything will be fine. Uh, there's nothing really to worry about, except there was because um, before I ever had a chance to really look into data validation, something unusual did occur. And that was in the case of data formats. So without going into too much detail, the app I'm talking about that I was working on at the time relied on having users upload data um, regularly. And upon this data, uh, then it, it was supposed to do some modeling, various types of processing, output graphs, all sorts of things like that. Um, this was all time series uh, related. And what ended up happening at one point was uh, users notified us that for some reason it looked like the app wasn't updating any, any outputs. And why, why was that the case? So immediately, once you get something like that, you're tempted to think, well, it sounds like probably what happened is the upload or data storage mechanism is buggy, something is unusual there. But after wasting quite a while looking into that and not finding anything wrong there, what turned out to actually have been the case was that because we weren't validating data formats, that particular time the data format had suddenly changed whenever uh, the users were uploading this. Um, and the gist of what happened next was these dates had been in the time series, had been converted to NAs, further down the line, uh, somewhere else, uh, had been removed by list-wise deletion, and that's why the behavior uh, observable to users was that there was no new data, apparently, even though they had uploaded it. So that's, again, why it's 
really important to make sure that you have um, expectations that are made explicit as part of a suite of validation tests. Otherwise, you can end up either sending people to appointments for nothing, uh, panicking that who knows what might be wrong with them, or uh, situations where you're going on this wild goose chase for a bug that actually doesn't exist because something completely different that you didn't think to catch was going on. So having covered that and hopefully clarified or, or convinced you why validation is really important actually, um, I wanted to say a few things about um, data validation principles and in terms of how to decide um, how exactly to implement data validation uh, routines. So if you think about all these types of scenarios like the ones that I just mentioned, um, whenever you're diving into a new project and thinking about creating new software, you need to start to think explicitly about, okay, in the case of bad inputs, what given the context of what you're designing and what it's supposed to do, what should it ideally do in terms of bad inputs? Should it uh, halt abruptly? In some cases, maybe that is preferable. Uh, or should it just keep going? Um, it's, it's an open question, but unless you're actually made aware of these things from the start, um, you might not put effort into things um, and or basically dedicate enough attention to them, they might just end up being uh, running away from you because of deadlines, because of everything else that has to be done. So that's really, again, why I wanted to emphasize this component of the talk much more. Okay, having said that, uh, two key ways of um, dealing with data validation are error handling and the other one will be assertions. So error handling uh, that has various forms in R could mean a bunch of things. Again, it depends exactly on what you're building and what you think makes sense for your particular particular scenario. So in one case, you might uh, uh, replace anything unusual with a so-called neutral value, if that makes sense, uh, or you might return a previous answer, or which is what um, we ended up doing in one app recently, display an error message to the user so that they know why the input they provided is doesn't fit the expectations of everything else that we built. Um, and assertions are basically what the R packages I'll talk about have to, uh, have to do with. Um, having covered all that, what should you do with these things? Are there situations where error handling is more appropriate than assertions or vice versa? Well, according to Code Complete, yes. Um, and here's where things might get slightly dicey and hopefully you'll see why there might be some slight differences in between the Code Complete world, uh, which is written by somebody with experience in Visual Basic, C++, um, Java and working at Microsoft versus the data science world where the types of problems or software might be substantially different, but we'll see about that in, in a second. So uh, this kind of standard uh, dev view holds that error handling should be used when you want to check for bad data and especially for conditions that you expect to occur and can foresee as being possible. So here we might have something like um, in our scenario, maybe a time series is way too short and uh, if it's a, a time series for sales, Maybe in some cases here and there, you might get the occasional time series that is just zero sales from start to finish um, or, or any sort of issue like that that might make things um, misbehave. So if you can kind of foresee anything like that um, and it comes from um, external less trusted data sources, then the code complete way is um, you're supposed to use error handling to deal with that. However, assertions on the other, other hand are I feel where things deviate most um, or can deviate most from the world of data science. So basically the argument here is that um, whenever somebody, let's say, uh, if I were to give an example, um, somebody might use uh, some refactoring on an older piece of code and 
accidentally end up changing the sorts of output that come from that function, which will lead to unforeseen consequences further down the line. Um, so in this case, even if uh, previously the source of the data was a trusted source, something has changed. And if you have an assertion in place to say the output of, of this function is supposed to formally have these characteristics and then suddenly it doesn't, that will allow you to say, okay, a bug has been inserted here and it'll be much easier to figure out where exactly it came from rather than the fact that it might produce very bizarre effects way further down the line and then you'll have a much harder time figuring out where it came from. So that's the argument of where to use assertions under this kind of context and code complete. Um, the rest I'll skip over because they actually um, overlap quite well with data science stuff. So as I was saying, things are not necessarily quite so simple. We can deal with other scenarios as well. And the key difference here is the use of assertions. So if previously in Code Complete we had seen something to do with assertions you should use for situations that normally should never occur, but because we're being defensive, uh, we want to make sure that these are in place and catch anything out of the ordinary, even though it shouldn't normally happen. In this case, like in the example I was giving with the Shiny app with the date formats, the data isn't to be trusted, yet we still have some expectations about it, so we can formalize them in assertions. So even if this is different, I don't think this is, um, this is a problem. So in this case, assertions could basically go either way. Um, hopefully that made, made sense. Um, in terms of um, the kind of meeting point uh, in between worlds, you're probably better off maybe even actually doing both. So even if you have a problem that's been spotted in your code uh, or an assertion that has failed, you can also handle it so that basically the software you build is as robust as possible. So um, that's pretty much what we ended up implementing in, in our app. Um, just a few quick notes about when or where to validate, usually as early as possible, if that would work. Um, for example, uh, if somebody submits a new data set that has names that are unusual or deviate from uh, what is expected based on previous data, as soon as the upload comes in, you're able to flag something like that. Um, I'm also weary of time and all the content that maybe I kind of got slightly carried away with, so I might start skipping over some things a bit faster if that's okay. Um, and leave it open to questions at the end in case somebody spots anything that is interesting to them and they want to know more. Um, the other, the other idea or uh, visualization that you, you might want to just basically hold on to, again, once you're uh, in a position of writing new software, is that code can be compartmentalized in a safe zone and a non-safe zone. So basically, depending on which area you're situating yourself in, uh, either immediately after the upload, let's say, in a Shiny app, which might be justifiably a non-safe zone, you might want to handle things in one way versus uh, further down the line once in theory, all the unusualness of the data will have been handled one way or another and the code assumes to be working with correct data or let's say formally correct data given what I'd been mentioning at the very top, the start of this talk. So having said that, um, how exactly might you want to deal with an issue whenever it does occur? Even if all the previous stuff I've been mentioning has had to do with defensive programming, offensive programming might have its own uh, uses here, especially in the development part of the, of the cycle. So if anything unusual happens, ideally you want to know and you want to know as soon as possible. So basically, you want things to fail hard. Um, <clears throat> however, that's not always the case. For anything more minor, it is actually fine to uh, deal with the issues um, silently. For anything like, let's say, 
duplicated columns or duplicated cases. You can just strip these without actually having to say uh, log any uh, errors in case of failed assertions or anything like that if it's if it's minor stuff. Okay, luckily that's all over uh, with hopefully everybody is still uh, with us and still awake after all that. Um, in terms of the actual criteria, it might be well worth uh, going over these just so you have um, a rough plan of the sorts of things you might want to consider when designing your rules uh, and at what level they might situate themselves at. So the most basic for tabular uh, data, which is what this uh, talk is all about, validating tabular data, um, the cell value uh, level uh, validation could be something like um, the date format not aligned to um, what the app or the software expects, uh, something that, that goes an, outside the range of legal values. Building up from that, you can extend these things to the entire column, but also add other, um, other validation um, rules that have to do with maybe the mean having to be close to a certain value or an exact value, uh, mentioning things consistently rather than varying throughout an entire column if you're referring to the street all the same but not basically using alternative forms for the same value. Um, at the row level, um, this I feel is maybe not quite as common but packages that I'll go over shortly have to do with that as well. So if you are interested in maybe validating a data set based on some multivariate distances that go by row, you will be able to do that as well. Again, if it's relevant to whatever you're trying to achieve or build. Uh, interestingly enough, you can set up um, validation rules that have to do with um, bivariate or multivariate uh, rules as well. Um, so anything like correlations or things that logically wouldn't make sense, but you want to make explicit so that anything unusual does get flagged uh, quickly. So for instance, in a data set where somebody has an age under 16, uh, yet they seem to have a full-time job, that immediately tells you that something has gone wrong there. Uh, and you would be able to actually formalize this into a validation rule um, in the packages that I'll mention shortly. Uh, also, uh, final ones, uh, you might have some rules that refer to a full data set uh, or even cross data sets, depending on whether you have to merge them or anything like that. So having mentioned all this stuff, what are some dedicated R packages that handle um, validation issues? Well, uh, first of all, the example data set that I chose to illustrate all these uh, packages is Anscombe's uh, Quartet. This is quite famous and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people, maybe everybody will have heard of this, but just in case anybody hasn't, um, the main idea here is that across these eight variables, if you pair them up two by two, the correlations are always the same, even if uh, the numbers themselves are uh, really quite different. In fact, even from the help file in, in R itself, um, you get this really nice explanation of what the whole um, idea is about. And very, very handy for us, um, you also actually get straight up some, some rules that have to do with this data set that we can use as validation rules, which is exactly what I've done and what follows. So with that in mind, um, oh yeah, I had forgotten about this slide. Uh, basically this just goes to show that depending on or regardless of how different the, the four sets of data are, um, the, um, the regression line will be the same. So that's the whole idea behind this, this data set, but that's not exactly what we're interested in just now. Uh, so first package in the lineup is uh, Validate and uh, in some way it's, I hope it's fair to say that it's slightly the odd one out and you'll see why. The, the way the syntax looks here is basically um, under the banner of a check that function, uh, you are able to specify all your um, 
constraints for the data, all your expectations. So exactly what I've been saying previously, um, stuff like at the level of the entire data set that this should always have eight columns, um, that various um, equality rules should always be followed. Um, validate also lets us set up variables on the fly and then basically end up um, specifying relationships between them. Um, what I've also done here is basically set this up to fail already, just so you get an idea of what you can expect from this package in terms of its outputs whenever some of your expectations are wrong. So what that means is you get something like this. You get this table that has, um, in this case, all the 15 um, rules that I specified uh, as part of the previous slide. Um, interestingly enough, um, errors are all false, yet uh, there are some fails. What this means is um, the fails pretty much count all the instances in which the data actually deviated from the rules that we specified. Now, the errors here would only have appeared if, say, in the previous slides, uh, instead of x4, I would have mentioned some variable that actually doesn't exist in the data set whatsoever. So it's not errors in terms of validation failures, but rather in terms of specifying the validation rules themselves, um, which is what sets this apart from all the, the next packages that I'm gonna talk about. Um, something else you can do with this package is create these sorts of visualizations uh, that tell you just how much uh, the data deviates from each given rule. That's kind of it in a nutshell in terms of validate. Um, in terms of assert R, which is the next one I have lined up, um, things are organized um, slightly differently. First of all, we have these general verify uh, verbs that can either apply to rules that have to do with the entire data set. So does it adhere to um, the naming convention that we expect for this data set? So we already know these columns must exist in there. We can specify that. We can verify whether the numbers of, of rows and columns are what we think they should be. Then at the level of um, individual values, we have a bunch of things that we might want to verify like these equalities and so on, but we can go even further than that and we can actually specify things by column and by row. Things are maybe slightly confusing here, or at least I thought they were. Um, in terms of um, this assert verb might sound very general, especially based on all the principles that I mentioned towards the start, but actually what this means in the context of assert R is it quite simply only looks within columns um, to verify whether the conditions that you specified are true. But if you want to actually look within columns and only evaluate the condition after the entire column has been looked at rather than go by values within a column, if that makes sense, then you use insist instead. It's slightly complicated. Um, and we have the same parallel versions of assert and insist, but that go by rows rather than by columns. Um, this is actually a really powerful package in that it works hand in hand with the second one that is called assertive. And that one has a huge, huge variety of um, checks that you might want to, to use. One that I just threw in here just for demonstration purposes is we want to make sure that wherever this is running is a Linux system, but it, there, there's so much variety in this package. This is just something I happen to choose. Um, first point or another point of departure from the previous validate package is what we're seeing here is no longer an output of uh, a summarized output of how much the data set is deviating from our rules or not, we actually have the data set itself. And this is much more in line to what some resource like Code Complete would, uh, would say. So as long, so long as the validation checks um, are passed, then no errors occur, everything is silent, and you basically can propagate this data, which is now considered to be fine because it adheres to all those rules, 
you can propagate it further through whatever system you've built, like a Shiny app or what have you. Um, however, if things fail, uh, like I have set things up to do right here, so uh, 12 is not the number of rows of this data set, and also this wasn't working on Windows at the time. So what this leads to is um, two errors uh, that have occurred, and now instead of being able to continue with data that is actually shown to deviate from our expectations, we have to stop in our tracks and do something about these errors, which is exactly what you want. Uh, something else that I'd almost forgotten to mention, if you want the entire set of rules to be followed and to be tested against the data, then you must actually, for this package, you must include a chain start and a chain end. Without these, what will happen is, in this case, things will fail on line five because there aren't 12 rows and any other subsequent errors won't be captured anymore. Whereas if you ideally want to see all the ways in which your data deviates from your assumptions, you need to uh, fit a chain around all these rules basically. So that's that package. Ensure, um, probably just to dive in uh, straight to the point of where this one um, shines, is the fact that um, you're able to um, specify a template for the correct data that you would expect and then any new incoming data uh, you're able to compare against that fixed template. So something that um, you're able to, um, to set up in terms of the template is any data that you're satisfied actually follows all the rules um, you've, you've set up. Um, you're able to basically get rid of all the rows under that, but what that leaves with is basically an empty structure, but which still preserves things like the column names, of course, the number of columns, and importantly, the classes of all of these things. So that's exactly what Ensure allows us to do here. Basically say for any new and incoming data, we wanna compare if the names are the same as our fixed template that never changes as well as going column by column if the classes are still the same for all of these things. So that's, that's something we actually ended up using because this is a really uh, cool feature. Um, that's probably the key thing to mention about this one. And again, much like in the previous uh, case, assuming all goes well, nothing terrible has happened with the data, then you simply get all the data set um, returned back to you so that you can keep using it further in the pipeline. But if that doesn't happen, uh, what you end up with is some errors again. In this case, Ensure by default will um, save all the errors it encounters as opposed to having to specify a chain start and a chain end. So uh, kind of halfway through in terms of the, the R packages, next one on the list is Checker. Um, this one, I thought was, had some really interesting characteristics here. So it makes it very easy to um, check overall characteristics of the data set. But as far as I've been able to tell, it's more difficult to check individual uh, column characteristics. So um, that's, that's something to bear in mind as opposed to the other um, options that I've mentioned previously. Also, in case you might be tempted to think that X1, X2, and all the rest of them are all constants of 10,000, that's not how this package operates. What this is really saying is whatever happens to be in the X1 uh, variable here, it's of the class numeric, just the same as this number that I supplied to it. You're only able to be super specific about uh, when something belongs to a set like X3 here, um, but otherwise um, you can't actually specify uh, ranges or anything like that in this values argument. Also in the same check data uh, function, you're not able to specify the correct total number of columns, interestingly enough. Um, but again, following the same sort of uh, rule, checker just gives you back the entire data, assuming nothing else has gone wrong. Um, oh yes, something that's important about this package though, remember that entire list of criteria that I mentioned towards the start about looking for validation at the level of either rows, columns, cells, what have you, 
this package does have functionality that lets you validate things like uh, merges between data sets. So that's, that's one thing to note. Okay, point blank, um, this one is really quite interesting in terms of being able to generate a really nice detailed report. Uh, this might be very useful to you if let's say you want to have a nice uh, interactive interface um, where if somebody let's say uploads data that doesn't uh, respect whatever rules you've set up, um, it's much easier to actually show them how this data deviates so that they can fix it rather than just give them an error that they, depending on their background, they might not know what to do with. So that's kind of um, one of the, the highlights of um, Point Blank. What we do in here is basically um, supply all of our rules again um, as part of various um, functions. And all of these are sandwiched in between this create agent and interrogate um, functions. So those are the ones that actually generate the report based on the evaluation of all these rules that we've specified. So what this looks like, assuming everything goes okay, um, which it has done in this case, this report goes by rule by rule uh, and gives you some details about uh, whether things fat, uh, passed or failed, and in how many cases. In the case of um, whether or not a column exists, there can only be one pass or one fail. However, for things that go at the level of individual values within a column, then you're going to have, let's say, 11 passes in this case, with there being 11 rows in this data set. So that's kind of the overall look of, of this report when things go well. When uh, things don't go well, you might end up uh, getting errors again of this nature. Um, you do get, again, two errors. You don't have to worry about things not being captured in case there are multiple validation failures. Um, also, if we re-add the create agent and interrogate functions, again, sandwiching all the rules, even if they fail this time, the way that will impact the report that you get at the end is you get this really um, convenient type of um, button where you can specifically download the cases where um, these, these rules are basically broken. Now, in case, like in, it, like in here on row 20, uh, I had specified a bogus rule that the number of rows in this data set is 60. So because this was actually not the case in terms of uh, what happens when you click the CSV download button, it'll give you the entire data set back. So depending on how much data you have, that may or may not be an issue. So it's something to be aware of. Okay, so ruler, um, what was this one about? Yes, yeah, so this one has uh, considerably different syntax from everything else I've shown you before. Uh, long story short, basically, uh, you create these packs of rules that can refer either to the entire data set, maybe I don't want or I don't expect this data set to have any missing values ever, depending on how it's created, maybe that's, a, that's justifiable. Uh, I wanted to have certain uh, classes and all of these things I can stick into a uh, general data pack of rules. I can do the same thing with um, a cell pack that has various individual uh, rules for the values. And then basically I expose the whole data set to all these packs and see if anything breaks. Um, again, same as before, you get the whole data set back assuming everything is fine. If things are not fine, like in this case where I set it up to fail just so that we can see what could happen, um, you end up getting uh, a error and additionally a report if you choose to uh, set things up that way as well. Um, in terms of the final dedicated package that I that I investigated for uh, for this talk, the final one is Checkmate, and. You'll have noticed at this point probably that all the previous packages tend to just uh, pipe together and connect together all sorts of um, uh, 
um, related rules that we have for the same source of data. Whereas in this case, uh, Checkmate seems to be more uh, dedicated to preconditions uh, for a function. So basically, if you've written a function that is supposed to take input that looks in a very specific way, then you're going to be able to set up all these little um, assertion statements that uh, look at various bits and pieces or various uh, requirements that you need for that function to run and assumes will be the case and the data you supply to it. So that's where these come in handy as kind of disconnected little checks. Um, so what you'll get here for each of them is an error or they'll be silent if things actually go well and actually follow your, your assumptions. Um, okay, so after all of that, um, the, the one thing I wanted to really kind of point out is that you needn't uh, think, in case you do, um, that just because you need to do to carry out validation, you need a dedicated validation package. There are various other ways to handle the same uh, sorts of issues depending on what your needs might be. So based on that, something that we ended up uh, using in an app is actually just the read underscore um, CSV function that allows you to specify um, on top of column names and themselves, their types. So this is maybe not appearing necessarily uh, as handy as everything uh, I've shown you before, but it might be at least in terms of how we set things up using um, Reader. What we did after specifying our expectations for all the data that's supposed to come in, um, we kind of created two, two streams of, of possibilities. Basically, if the number of parsing problems as specified by all of these, uh, these types that we mentioned above is above zero, then basically the user of this shiny app, which is what it was, would see something like found this number of parsing errors in whatever columns. Um, and then they would basically have within their grasp a way to deal with the, the issue, go back to the kind of hypothetical drawing board, fix their upload, and then try again, basically having been armed with this, this information about why things didn't work. Uh, if everything seems to go fine and things parse normally uh, without any, any particular output in this problems uh, function, then continue with whatever you wanted to do with that data anyway. So there, there are multiple ways to handle validation. Again, it just kind of depends on what you're going for. And a really good starting point is just having an idea of um, what is out there so that you can just make an informed decision about what works best for you. Um, and this is exactly the sort of output from problems. So basically, because I set things up, things up to fail um, and specified that Y2, which is actually just a regular numeric variable, should be a date, all the values within Y2 are now flagged as problems. Therefore, the output of this is not null. We have an issue. We can flag an error that is as helpful as possible to the user so they can fix things. Okay almost there um, in terms of conclusions. So after having gone over all that stuff, uh, what's, what's the, key, the key message? Uh, what is there uh, left here as a take home um, message? So one of them is the fact that after having discussed all the uh, dedicated validation packages, uh, as well as an extra tool, maybe something like uh, read CSV uh, combined with the number of problems when reading. Um, I'd say a good, um, a good conclusion from all that discussion is that there is not necessarily a one-stop shop, uh, one dedicated tool you can use. It's okay or perhaps even necessary to customize depending on what you want to do. Um, the other essential thing I wanted to um, to emphasize and hopefully I managed to get across is that data validation teaches you to think defensively and a really important concept in Code Complete is that by teaching you how to think about programming that allows you to code 
into a language, not in it. The distinction being that regardless of what language you happen to be using, as long as you have these uh, really healthy guiding principles, you'll actually manage to translate those into whatever language you need to be working with. Um, again, uh, related to the defensive programming idea, your code will be more robust if you do things this way. So again, assert things and handle the errors, as I was saying towards the beginning of the talk. Um, kind of a byproduct of this entire uh, process is the fact that you're forced uh, to think more deeply about what you assume about the data and check that you've actually understood the data um, as deeply as you can in order to formulate all these rules in the first place. And sometimes, especially under uh, time constraints, you might just think something looks okay, but unless you take the amount of time necessary to write these rules, things might just not um, register and something that is not actually okay might slip past you. Um, and finally, but I guess last but not least, um, the fact that more often than not, at least in my experience, a data scientist isn't the person who is generating or isn't the custodian of, of the data. So by actually even attempting to formalize all these validation rules that I mentioned, by definition, you have to go to the people who actually own the data and work very closely with them to try to figure out what makes sense to code into a validation rule. And that's actually uh, been a, a really good process for us working on a project recently. Um, yeah, I think at this point, this is, this is all I had to cover. I did uh, go very slightly over the, the time limit, but hopefully that's okay. Um, and yeah, I'll uh, stop sharing now and let Jared jump back in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Katerina. Uh, we haven't figured out how to do a, a, a virtual applause. So everyone just applause in place, give a golf clap or something. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Katerina, for uh, that wonderful talk. So we had a few questions roll in. Um, you know, John Sabini's in the chat, clap, clap. He's at least typing out clap, clap. That works. Thank you, John. Cool. Thank you. All right. So first up, um, can you talk more about the insist function? Uh, the person said it slipped by them a little bit. How I guess that's different than the assert. Okay. Let me, let me quickly have another look at those slides. Uh, <laughs> okay. Right, so that was in assert R. I'm um, thinking maybe I should, um, let me see, share the screen again. Okay, so hopefully that's visible now. Yep. Yep. Uh, so insist is basically doing uh, a very similar job to assert. But the difference is here that in order to figure out, for instance, whether you have any outliers in a given column, you can't do that by a, on a value by value basis within the column. So the way this package works is it needs to distinguish in between when you look within a column, but cell by cell, as opposed to looking at all the values within that column uh, jointly to try to figure out whether something is, a, is an outlier, for instance. So that's when you would use assert versus insist, even if both of them conceptually are related to columns. I hope that made sense. So assert is vectorized and insist is like a summary function. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so this is a more of a general purpose question about this, and there's a few of these. Um, how do you choose which package is best for your data validation work? I know you said there's no one size fits all, but do, do these packages fit neatly into the validation methods you discussed in the beginning? Well, not exactly. So this is, uh, this is a sort of struggle I also had when trying to figure out what to actually use uh, in what we ended up building. So... It depends. Uh, it's possible this example with Ans Anscombe's quartet was slightly contrived. Your actual real life data might have 
way fewer constraints than this. You might just be interested in having only a minimum and a maximum value um, allowable and just some fixed column names and that's it. And, and then if you have something as simple as that, then I don't think it particularly matters what you use. There's gonna be a lot of overlap in between these packages. So it, it doesn't really matter. Having said that, one issue where, um, and to be, to be fair, I don't actually know the full answer to this, this myself. I only glanced at this and I can't remember which package actually had some data on this, but most of them don't seem to. For very big data sets, depending on your definition of very big, I don't know if one of them might emerge as being the most um, efficient. So that's something you might wanna take into account. Uh, but again, it's probably gonna be a, a trial and error type of thing, depending on what your data looks like. And if you just end up uh, using one of them over the others and saying that it seems to work, then that's one thing. Um, the other thing is when we ended up having to look at how to do, to carry out validation on our data sets, when that entire um, situation came up with the date formats and all the rest of it. At that point, it was really quite late in the game when we had to integrate all this. So it was already, that ship had kind of sailed almost in terms of integrating some kind of neat one single package solution because all sorts of code already pre-existed. This uh, read uh, CSV code was already there to deal with the, um, uh, with the uploads. And it's only at that point that we realized, oh, oh wait, actually within the read CSV function, we already have what we need to do the validation that we're interested in. So we didn't need to go looking for a, a specific package to deal with, say, making sure that the date column always exists um, and actually has a date class, because that was already handled with that. So I guess it just depends so much on what exactly you're trying to do that it kind of is a trial and error and go explore sort of thing. I was hoping, I am still hoping that by just giving you an overview of what's out there, I'm just going to help you along in figuring out which of these might work best for you. Great. And to follow up on that question, something in a similar vein, um, would you say that the insurer package is the closest to you know, the best when practicing offensive validation techniques? Uh, insurer. Um, not really, because uh, with the exception of validate, that doesn't actually stop you in your tracks if something fails. It'll just summarize the extent to which things fail as a table, but it won't stop a, a pipeline from continuing with bad data. Um, all the rest of the ones actually have this functionality uh, of asserting a thing, and if that happens to be false, uh, throwing up an error. So that, that won't be the uh, specific um, advantage of Ensure. What Ensure does use nicely and we did do later is, um, did implement in our project is um, it allows you to have this kind of fixed golden standard that is empty though uh, of what the data structure should look like in terms of um, column classes, um, and column names. So that's, that's one thing that that's really good for. And speaking of packages, do you know what happened to assert that? Um, so I haven't looked at this one. Um, I think it was my, sorry. It's been lost to history. Yeah, potentially. Um, I'll have to actually go back and look at that because I remember seeing it, but for some reason, I I can't remember why I didn't include it. So sorry about that one. Um, yeah, I'll have to go back and check what, what the situation was there. Um, what I do remember noticing is assert R and especially if you combine it with assertive, there's 
so much there that it's almost overwhelming. So I guess if you if you wanted just something really broad because you had a huge variety of conditions you wanted to test, you're likely to probably find them in this duo. Uh, but in terms of assert that, I can't actually remember where that fits in with the rest of the story and everything else I mentioned. Okay. So remember, there's like two came out at the same time, like assert that and assert R, and one might, I guess, maybe assert that disappeared. Mm. Then we have a question about system dependencies. Is it possible of any of these packages, or maybe another one, to validate that a system dependency is present, like libcurl2 is, in, libcurl is installed, or libxml2, or should they just use file.exist to check that? Okay, that's a great question. Um... There, again, there were system related or, yeah, actually, uh, whether or not dependencies exist, uh, whether or not files exist, all these things, I am 99% sure lived in assertive, which is pretty massive. So um, yeah, for anything like that, that doesn't have to do with um, a data set itself. I think this one is out of the whole bunch, your best bet to go digging uh, into. Okay, so assertive folks for anyone who missed that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, there's another question about how do you parse the output from the summary reports to be able to programmatically make decisions on whether to continue or not? How do you parse it? Um, how, do you get, how do you get the information out of the summary reports? Cause like some of these generated these reports, well, do you let them go through? Do you let them not? Is there like, are they data frames or reports? So that's the thing. I, I probably wouldn't do anything based on the reports themselves. I'd probably work on the um, errors themselves. One thing I didn't mention earlier is some of these packages, um, let's see if I can actually find an example here somewhere uh, so that what I say will actually make a bit more sense. Um, yeah, so this is another thing having to do with Ensure, but I don't think it was the only one, but it'll just um, serve the purpose of showing you what I mean. Um, whenever something fails, uh, one of these tests, for some of these packages, this one included, you can actually type up your really pretty looking um, error message yourself so that if you wanted to, you could actually use this and inform users of uh, what's gone wrong without something looking very cryptic and horrible. Um, so once you have something like that set in place, I don't know that I would use um, any reports to actually do anything in the, let's say, server side of a Shiny app. I would just go by the fact that some error existed and decide by that. What the report would really be more useful for is sending it off to a human for extra details if they need it. But in terms of what the app's behavior should be like, I don't think that should depend um, on uh, a report or a summary, but just whether or not something failed in the tests, if that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Hopefully it makes sense to the person who asked the question. Great. And then there's a few other questions that you actually answered and the people are like, oh, never mind, she answered that. So okay. we don't need to go through those anymore, I guess, because um, you answered them. So good job. So yeah, yeah. Um, there's a question not for you, but I see Amada is asking it to Luda about joining our ladies. Um, I, and I, Amada asked, you just, join, you just join the group and attend a meetup. So yes, we highly encourage everyone who wants to go to it, uh, go join our ladies that way. Great. Yep. Yep, that had nothing to do with you, but that was something in the chat window. So, um, okay, I'll give a last minute chance. We went through a lot of questions. I'll give one last minute chance to see if anyone wants to throw throw a question at Katarina. Otherwise, we will. Oh, there is a question. See, it's always good I get that last chance. Um, then we'll go through and call the random names or who's going to win the prizes. All right. So we have a question in terms of error messages. Do those neatly come up in modals? Like, if you're doing this in Shiny, can you put them up neatly in a modal? Yes, that's exactly what we did. Uh, so assuming you can still see my screen over here. Um, yeah. This is kind of almost pseudocode at this point because um, uh, there was too much to include, but I tried to include as much as possible to actually um, give you an idea of how this, this thing was coded. So 
in this particular example, let's say um, you read the CSV that was just uploaded by a user and see whether or not any parsing problems uh, appear. If they do, the number of problems here will go above zero. And if that's the case, um, you see something like this, right? So once you have this output from problems from the, from the upload, um, you can build some nicer text around that. So what we did was something like this. Uh, you could say found, in this case, whoops, uh, found 11, the number of rows here, uh, parsing errors and columns, the column, the unique column being Y2. Um, please check the upload, correct any problematic values and try again. And this is general enough that it'll work for uh, sort of anything that the output in here, sorry, uh, throws up at you. So it could be something like uh, found uh, 20 parsing errors if this had 20 rows across columns Y2 and Y3, if that also happened to be present there. Um, so you can craft things in a way, based on this at least, uh, that you get a nice um, character at the end of that, um, or string, that you can save instead, or at least that's what we did here, save instead of the actual upload itself, then later on somewhere in the uh, server function you can check whether or not uh, this upload thing is still a data frame or a tibble or whatever it's actually supposed to be versus a character. And if it's a character, then you'll know that that's actually an error message and something went wrong. And in that case, you can stick it into a sweet alert or something like that and actually show it to the user so that they know what to do. So that's kind of what we ended up uh, doing. I don't know if there might be a, a better way to handle things, but that's how we designed it. Yeah, that'll make Dean Atali very happy. For, for those who don't know, Dean Atali is like out of Toronto, this like huge shiny user. So he'd be very happy to hear that. Yeah. I think he actually worked on one of the um, either shiny alert or alerter packages, sweet alert, something like that. Yeah, well, one of those is is his true. Yeah. Okay, so shiny alert and shiny. He definitely wrote shiny JS and I guess shiny alert. And there's mm -hmm. another one called no sweet alert R never made it to Cran because Dean's package superseded sweet alert R or something like that. Right. Yeah. So I, I think we did use Dean's actually. So there you go. Yeah, Dean writes a lot of good stuff. Okay, so it seems like we are out of questions. So we are going to do some giveaways just to close it out. Yay. So we could let, I was going to say we could let Katarina draw names at random. Uh, but that might put her on the spot because she has to search through the list. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I want to just take it easy now, do nothing. Yeah, all right. So in, in the spirit of that, to make it easy on you, I'm going to let Amada fly through here. Now, here's what's the thing, folks. You have to be, I guess... Unless Amada has a list from earlier, or do you have, I don't think you have email addresses. No, I wanted to reward people who stay till the end. Perfect. So <laughs> pull through people. So what's going to happen, folks, since we don't have uh, necessarily access to all of your, your way to contact you, if Amada calls out your name, you're going to have to be in contact with us. All right? Um, um, uh, I'll let Amada decide how you get in contact with her. There's so many different ways, Slack, email, whatever. Um, books we have to give away. Um, it'll be anything public. Uh, so John, uh, it's John, Dean Atali, A-T-A-L-I. Um, anything from O'Reilly's on virtual for, uh, digital books, eBooks is, is up for grabs. You win, you tell us which eBook you want, you get it. And then we're gonna give away one of those and then two books from Pearson. Um, you have a choice of, and I believe they're virtual books, right Amada, not the physical books? Yes, they're eBooks and e we have three options. You have three options, you have my book, R for Everyone, Dan Chen's book, pandas for everyone and was the third the deep learning illustrated yes. and um john crons he spoke at the conference recently um deep deep learning illustrated so those so if you win one of the pearson prizes you could choose between those three ebooks and if you win the, the o'reilly prize any ebook they have i guess so amada search for our lucky winners sure and the O'Reilly one is anything on their website, but it ha O'Reilly has to be listed as the publisher. So almost anything on their website. Cool. So, um, all right, I'm going to choose at random. Catherine. 
Uh, okay. Um, Mark Platts. And Millie Sims. Okay. Catherine, Mark Platts, Millie Sims. You have now have to get in touch with Amada. Amada, how do you want them to talk to you on Slack, email? But how do you want them to get in touch with you? So um, either here in the Zoom chat, you can send me your email, or if you are in the Slack channel, uh, I'm Amada. I should be Amada-R meetup uh, or Amada-R conference. Great. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Amada, for uh, drawing the names. Uh, thank you, Katerina, for the excellent talk. Thanks for having me. Very happy to have you here. Maybe one day we'll be able to have you in person in New York City. Yeah, I would love that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so everyone, uh, thank you. Congratulations to the winners. Remember, next month, November 9th, December 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. And we already have actually speakers lined up for the next three months in the new year. We'll announce those as we get going. Uh, so a big virtual round of applause for Katarina. And we'll see everyone virtually next time. Hopefully one day in person soon, like having Katarina in New York. Hopefully we'll have everyone in person. I look forward to that. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.